Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to the doctor's track in this afternoon session. We will have a focus on uh, localized disease. Uh, we start uh, with resectable, borderline resectable disease in the first session. Uh, together with my co chair, Teresa Macarula from uh, Barcelona, Spain, and uh, I will hand over the chair now to her. Thank you, Joel. Uh, so, um, thank you. Welcome all of you of this, um, in this uh, session, in which we will talk first of all to the resectable disease. And for this, we will start with a, uh, with a clinical case. Uh, Dr. Goldman from Salzburg will uh, explain the clinical case of a patient, a frail patient with a receptive, receptive pancreatic cancer uh, tumor. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the Seacock family uh, and Academy uh, that they invited me to present the first case here in front of such a distinguished audience. Um, in my, these are my big disclosures. Um, in the first, in this first case, short case, um, a patient came to me, or a 70-year, 78-year-old man came to me in December 2017 because the general practitioner um, sent him to our oncology clinic. Um, the, uh, the patient lost um, 13 kilograms uh, within a few weeks and com uh, complained about night sweats and complained about diarrhea. The man was in good shape uh, at that time point. He presented with an ECOG performance score of one. Uh, had not many comorbidities, just a non-alcoholic uh, steer to hepatitis and arterial hypertension and had a negative uh, family uh, history uh, concerning cancer. We performed uh, CT images and uh, as you can see in these CT uh, scans uh, that um, a tumor mass measuring 2.5 centimeters in the pancreatic uh, head as well as a cystic lesion uh, originating from the transition zone from the pancreatic body to tail with close contact to the stomach uh, were identified. The patient didn't show any signs of uh, biliary obstruction and the tumor markers CEA and CA199 were not elevated. In the next step, we discussed or we introduced this patient to the multidisciplinary uh, tumor board and Based on the CT images, um, the patient case was considered resectable. There was no arterial tumor contact with the celiac axis, uh, with supermesenteric artery, or the common hepatic artery. There was no tumor contact with the portal vein, and the tumor contact uh, with the supermesenteric vein was below 180 degrees. And as I said, the patient underwent total pancreatectomy, partial gastrectomy, splenectomy. Um, he got a hepatico hepaticoyeonostomy and duodenoyeonostomy. And as, so, as uh, we suspected, uh, the pathology report revealed a pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, poorly differentiated, PT3, PN11 out of 67 lymph nodes was involved, lymphovascular invasion, perineural invasion, and unfortunately, uh, positive resection margin status uh, uh, in the retroperitoneal margin. In the meanwhile, we performed DPT uh, deficiency analysis and we could not find uh, DPT deficiency and uh, as expected, uh, postoperatively tumor markers were not elevated. Unfortunately, the patient uh, experienced bilateral pulmonary embolism requiring therapeutic anticoagulation, and on the other side, as expected, with total pancreatectomy, the patient developed a pancreatic diabetes requiring an insulin pump continuously, resulting in an ECOG performance status of two and a Karnofsky performance status of 60. When he came to our clinic again to discuss about the adjuvant chemotherapy protocol. At this time point, in March 2018, the results of the Prodige 24 trial have not been published, so uh, which uh, established uh, the modified Fulfirinox protocol for fit patients as the standard of care in the adjuvant setting. 
Uh, but however, even if we had known this information, this patient with an equal performance status of two would not have qualified for this protocol. And according to um, the NCCN and ESMO guidelines, we, um, um, we recommended the patient to start capecitabine with gemcitabine for six months, analogous to the SPAC-4 trial that you all know in the SPAC-4 trial, gemcitabine plus capecitabine proved superior in terms of overall survival uh, in comparison to gemcitabine alone, the former standard of care. And if we take a low, closer look uh, in, at the Kaplan-Meier curves below, which um, takes into account the treatment protocol as well as the resection margin, we see that the gemcitabine pl plus capecitabine, the experimental arm, does not show a clear benefit in this case where the resection margin was positive compared with gemcitabine alone, here shown in slide blue. Okay, so we started uh, gemcitabine plus capecitabine analogous to the ASPAC-4 trial in March 2018. The patient had slightly elevated baseline transaminases due to his non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And during the course of the first cycles, the patient showed ele an elevation of transaminases, which uh, forced us to discontinue capecitabine and go on with gemcitabine monotherapy from June 2018. With this approach, the patient, or uh, the transaminases were declining and the patient could um, finish adjuvant chemotherapy with gemcitabine alone uh, after six months in August. We then, unfor uh, so due to the mentioned risk factors, it was an R1 resection, a lymphovascular invasion, peroneural invasion, lymph node positivity, and poorly differentiation, we decided to, uh, to perform surveillance CT images every three months. And, uh, also because there was no tumor marker that could guide us postoperatively. 15 months after the completion of the adjuvant chemotherapy, the patient came uh, to discuss the results of a surveillance, a routine surveillance CT image, which showed uh, a local recurrence. The patient was concerning this local recurrence completely asymptomatic, and we initiated an FDG PET CT scan to prove or confirm that this was the only tumor lesion uh, at the moment and to rule out occult metastasis. Then we introduced this patient again to the multidisciplinary tumor board and this tumor board colleagues told us this uh, local recurrence is inoperable and therefore we started uh, chemoradiotherapy with gemcitabine weekly in October for five five weeks, uh, which were completed in November 2019. The cumulative radiation dose was 55 degrees uh, gray. In the first restaging with FDG PET, uh, with a FDG PET scan, uh, we documented a complete metabolic remission and there were no other sites of or distant metastasis. In the meanwhile, we completed the predictive biomarker panel. So we uh, looked at BRCA, B, BRCA1 and 2 mutations, somatic mutations, but didn't find any of those. This patient was, uh, the tumor was microsatellite stable and we didn't detect N-track fusions. Unfortunately, the patient presented to our clinic before the next scheduled appointment because of painless jaundice and uh, we performed CT images uh, rapidly again and unfortunately saw a progressive disease of the local recurrence as well as new uh, uh, liver metastasis uh, spread uh, bilaterally. Um, endoscopic ex the endoscopic examination revealed that there was a hepatic hepatico stenosis and in the next steps the patient uh, underwent an ERCP and placement of a stent but this didn't solve the biliary occlusion problem. And in uh, the next step, the patient uh, uh, necessitated percutaneous uh, biliary drainage. The B 
biliary drainage improved, but unfortunately the patient died um, in, in May 2020 uh, due to uh, sepsis. To sum this case up, the patient underwent sur curative surgery, received uh, um, gemcitabine with capecitabine analogous to the SPAC for trial, but unfortunately had to quit capecitabine due to hepatotoxicity. Then uh, he entered our surveillance program with very close uh, uh, surveillance CT scans uh, in, three, in every three months. And after 15 um, months, the patient uh, experienced a local recurrence, underwent, because the status was inoperable, chemoradiotherapy with gemcitabine weekly, and unfortunately um, developed metachronous metastasis in April 2020 and died uh, because of sepsis in May 2020. To sum it up, the patient from the start of adjuvant chemotherapy uh, until he died achieved a um, median uh, overall survival of 26 months, which is comparable to the uh, results uh, published in the SPAT4 trial with uh, a range of 21 to 27 months. Um, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions if there are any. If there are specific questions of the clinical case, because if not, the discussion will be at the end of, the, um, of all this. Yeah. Okay, so if not, thank you. And now, uh, Dr. Strobel, that is the head of the surgical unit here in Vienna, will uh, discuss with us the, uh, how to define the resectability. Thank you. Uh, excuse me. I don't find the mouse. Uh, where is my mouse? Ah, here. Okay. So it's all this kind of. For those who are following us um, via remote, uh, you can put your questions online and we will try at the end at the discussion part also to um, address your questions. So please feel free and give us your questions also uh, via the online function. Um, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear chairman, uh, first of all, I'm happy to be here. This is my first uh, CCOG, um uh, academy and I think it's great I will certainly uh, always come back uh, so my uh, my job is uh, to talk about how to assess resectability in pancreatic cancer the surgeon's view and I'm trying to give you this in the next uh, 30 minutes first of all why is resection important I think there is no doubt uh, that in localized pancreatic cancer, long-term survival can only be achieved by resection in combination with systemic therapy. And therefore, uh, the, the strategy has to aim at giving both therapy modalities to these patients with localized pancreatic cancer. If you look uh, at this data from the United States, uh, you see that even in stage one and two pancreatic cancer, uh, survival without surgery is basically zero after five years, whereas uh, it is around 20% with surgery. Um, if we look at this international uh, study, we see that in stage one and two pancreatic cancer, resectability rates range between 30 and uh, 70% uh, with a slight increase over time, but this means that the majority or a large part of patients with uh, stage one and two pancreatic cancer do not receive surgery. Uh, stage one and two pancreatic cancer is not early pancreatic cancer. Stage two can already be borderline resectable with venous inf uh, infiltration. Um, why, why is this? Uh, this probably has to do with a certain uh, therapeutic nihilism towards pancreatic cancer. Uh, because um, many doctors uh, uh, still think 
uh, patients with pancreatic cancer had, have such a poor prognosis and surgery is uh, associated with a decrease in, in uh, quality of life and therefore not indicated. Here you see uh, the stage dependent survival of pancreatic cancer and uh, you see that uh, it, it's actually quite good in early stage and even in stage 2b it's 24.4 uh, months after surgery uh, independent of administration of chemotherapy in the in this study um, what do we have to consider as surgeons uh, a radical resection uh, aiming at an at a resection free margin with a one millimeter distance um, is associated with survival and relevant for survival. In this study, we did in Heidelberg in more than 500 patients with pancreatic duodenectomy for adenocarcinoma, we found that uh, both the, uh, a 40 month median survival and a 40% five year survival after an R0 resection with a one millimeter distance of the tumor cells to the nearest margin. But uh, if the march, if uh, tumor cells uh, come one millimeter uh, to the margin, but are not directly at the margin, uh, the survival is still relatively good with 27.5 months median survival and 30% five year survival. And even if the margin is directly involved, uh, survival is more than 20 months and 20% five year survival. So an R1 resection is not the disaster it's frequently thought of. Um, so how do we assess resectability preoperatively? Of course, uh, by radiology and for surgeons, uh, the CT is preferred, but uh, MRI is all, also a good modality and we need an assessment of the vasculature. So a, a, an imaging with an arterial phase and a venous phase. Um, uh, the resectability criteria are, of course, uh, uh, um, the criteria that we usually look at if we, did, if we discuss resectability. And uh, this is all about uh, the vasculature, uh, involvement of the major vessels that are located around the pancreas, the supramesenteric and portal vein, uh, the celiac axis with its branches and uh, the SMA. And uh, according to the relationship of the tumor and involvement of these vessels, uh, we uh, can distinguish resectable, borderline resectable, and locally advanced pancreatic cancer. Resectable is basically without contact to the vessels or, or only short contact to the two veins. A borderline resectable uh, can, uh, is an, an, a venous infiltration and a tumor abutment of the artery uh, less than 180 degrees and uh, what is more than 880 deg uh, 180 degrees is locally advanced. So the, these criteria, and this is uh, here uh, highlighted the MD Anderson Cancer Center and the IAP criteria, but there is also the NCCN criteria that you have seen. Uh, these are designed to be objective criteria, but the problem is they are applied subject, subjectively. Um, and uh, so here, uh, this is a, a study by radio performed by radiologists uh, from Korea. They looked at um, 600 patients with pancreatic cancer and uh, looked at uh, the, um, the assessment of retrospectively, the assessment of resectability and, uh, all, and uh, its association to different factors, including resection margin status and uh, the, um, the, um, the resectability criteria in this study was uh, associated with resection margin status. So if a tumor was considered resectable, our zero resections were more frequent. So certainly this is of much use for surgeons, but the problem is, uh, uh, this, and this is about subjectivity. Um, in this other study, um, the, uh, this group of radiologists looked at uh, CT scans of more than 100 patients with pancreatic cancer, and uh, those were analyzed by eight uh, experienced, more or less experienced uh, radiologists. And what comes out in this uh, study, I 
cannot go into this in detail, but resectability assessment, um, there, there was a relatively pure consistency among reviewers and, or, uh, and a large discrepancy among reviewers and uh, only uh, a subset of very experienced reviewers had a high consistency. Um, and, and this is what comes out then uh, if, if uh, patients are evaluated in uh, multidisciplinary team assessment, tumor boards, which is of course state of the art. This is a study uh, where 19 standard patients with imaging and other information with localized pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma were evaluated in seven uh, 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 multidisciplinary team uh, boards across Northern Europe. And uh, here on the left hand, you can see uh, the, um, the assessment or the, re the result of the assessment of resectability of these cases, which uh, was only uh, um, the same in all tumor boards in two patients, and everything uh, and in all other patients, uh, there uh, it was very uh, very uh, heterogeneous, and so of course was then the treatment allocation. This means. Uh, if you present the same cases to different uh, tumor boards, if the patient goes to different hospitals, the assessment will be very uh, different and quite heterogeneous. And uh, that's, that's one of the problems why the resection rates of uh, stage one and two pancreatic cancer are not as high as uh, they should be. Um, why is this? This is because of objectivity versus subjectivity. Activity, these criteria are not completely objective. We need objective criteria, and I will show you a little bit how we could approach this in the future. This is uh, one strategy that uh, this is the uh, guidelines of the International Association of Pancreatology, uh, including surgeons, but also uh, gastroenterologists and oncologists. And um, as they um, uh, recommended not only to look at the anatomical, these are the radiological criteria, but also on biological criteria. They used CA99, the uh, gold standard biomarker in pancreatic cancer, and conditional criteria. Conditional uh, is a reflection of patient risk uh, performance status. Um, so I think this is a way to go forward, but this has never been validated, and also it is not used in, in, in the clinic, at least not in a broad um, fashion. Uh, yeah, now, some examples. So this is a resectable pancreatic cancer that you can see here in the pancreatic head. The supramesenteric artery and the supramesenteric vein are not involved. And even in such a tumor, you have to do a radical resection. You can see here the vein. You can see here the artery completely free of the surrounding tissue. That's uh, how a CITUS should look, even in resected pancreatic cancer, because otherwise you have a high risk of an R1 resection and a poorer prognosis. This is uh, a borderline resected pancreatic cancer. You can see that the vein is here 180 degrees involved, and probably there is also a little bit contact to the artery. Uh, this was also, um, this patient was uh, taken to the OR for an upfront resection. You can see here. Uh, the, this venous involvement was addressed with a segmental resection with end-to-end -end anastomosis and the arteries are free. This also was an R0 resection. It only can be done by, by radical techniques. Um, but but uh, resectability in pancreatic cancer is not only about relation to the standard anatomy. Uh, this is uh, the surgical point of view. Uh, this is the standard anatomy. Uh, and this is only relevant or only uh, true for uh, around 40% of the patients. All other patients has diff have different vascular anatomy. And if you, for example, in this case, have uh, a, a, a infiltration of this hepatic artery, there is enough blood supply through the other hepatic artery and you can take this artery. This is not unresectable and you can achieve the same resection margin. So this has to be considered by the surgeon. Um, and uh, this is, for example, one um, 
patient uh, where, where this is relevant. You can see here, a t uh, or you cannot see the tumor, but in this angiography, you can see here that the caliber of the artery uh, changes, and this is a sign of an infiltration here of the gastro or of the hepatic artery close to the gastroduodenal artery. And this patient was considered, or this tumor was considered unresectable, presented uh, for a second opinion, and uh, there you can see that he. This patient had uh, this kind of uh, um, uh, anatomy where the uh, hepatic artery is completely replaced and comes from the supramesenteric artery. And this is the resection. So this is the, super, the situs after resection. This is the supramesenteric artery. Here is the hepatic artery. And here uh, is the, the uh, stump of the gastrodenal artery. So this could be taken radically uh, and, and therefore you have to have this um, special knowledge. Um, another relevant um, um, uh, factor is um, uh, uh, celiac axis stenosis. Uh, if you have a stenosis of the celiac axis, uh, there is a, collateral, a collateralization of uh, the, uh, the hepatic artery perfusion through the pancreatic head. And if you then do a pancreatic head resection, you take away these collaterals and the patient will have liver ischemia. Uh, this is relevant and there is different techniques to, to um, um, address this problem. Um, uh, in this case, for example, uh, usually you can, you, there is the so-called so arcuate ligament, which makes an extrinsic stenosis by compression of the uh, uh, celiac axis, and this can be addressed by surgery. But in some cases, like in this case, it uh, even if you take away this uh, ligament, uh, the, the, the stenosis remains. And this was, for example, addressed by uh, arterial resection. Um, and in this recent study that uh, we did when, when I was still in Heidelberg, uh, we found that uh, even a, uh, a um, non-severe stenosis of the celiac axis of 30 to 50 percent by vascular surgeons, this would be co considered non-relevant, non uh, in, uh, increases the risk of complications after pancreatic head resection. So this is something that as surgeons we have to consider in the future more carefully if we assess resectability of pancreatic cancer. Uh, in addition, there is a venous involvement that also can result in uh, or usually, or, or in the past, was considered unresectable uh, because the resection was associated with a too high risk of severe complications in patients where the veins are completely closed, not, not only infiltrated, but completely closed, and then you have a severe blood loss uh, during surgery and so on. And there is uh, surgical techniques to overcome these problems by uh, a bypass that you um, in the beginning of the res or before resection as first step in the operation um, you do a bypass and then uh, after you have done the resection you can remove the bypass or shorten the bypass um, here you can see such a case where a long bypass between the supramesenteric vein and the and here the portal vein has been Intro, uh, has been put in place, then the tumor has been resected. You can see here the other vessels, the supramesenteric artery, the hepatic artery, and then uh, this bypass is shortened. You can see here the small bowel. You have no small bowel congestion, which, which used to be a problem before, then uh, uh, making the reconstruction where you use the small bowel um, uh, um, um, with a high risk of morbidity with this technique you have a low risk of morbidity. So surgery is evolving. Uh, in borderline resectable pancreatic cancer with venous involvement, what about locally advanced pancreatic cancer with arterial involvement, like this pancreatic body cancers? Uh, in these cancers, the veins are also involved. You can see here this collateralization, but here you can see that the arteries are also involved. Uh, and in this case, there is different options. I think the best option is neoadjuvant therapy, and I will tell you uh, why in the in the next slides. Uh, there is some special techniques where an upfront resection is technically possible. 
I think in these cases, if you have a arterial involvement, uh, the prognosis is poorer than um, with venous involvement or, or, or resect in resectable pancreatic cancer. And the risk of surgery is even higher. And as always in medicine, we have to weigh the risk and the benefit versus the benefit we, we achieve or we can achieve. And, in, and I think for arterial resection, we should always uh, have a strategy of neoadjuvant therapy. What we should not do is just say, okay, this is a patient for palliative therapy without surgical reassessment. The patient should always go back to the uh, multidisciplinary uh, boards to be reassessed for potential resectability. Uh, what, what happens after neoadjuvant therapy with resectability? Uh, this is a study from, from Boston, the Massachusetts General Hospital, where they retrospectively analyzed pay, uh, the, the imaging of, of patients after neoadjuvant therapy of patients uh, who were successfully resected. And the, the majority of these, uh, uh, case, uh, of these patients, their tumors, were considered unresectable by the most uh, senior pancreatic surgeon. And uh, this is also what uh, is the um, experience in major uh, pancreatic centers around the world. After neoadjuvant therapy, the resectability criteria, the, the radiological resectability criteria are no longer applicable. Why is that? Uh, if we think about the histology uh, of pancreatic cancer, this becomes clear. Pancreatic cancer, you have a lot of stroma and some only some tumor cells. So under therapy, the tumor cells may go away. The stroma largely remains, and therefore you still have the mass. And this mass may still be around the artery, but uh, if you take it off, you, uh, the pathologist will tell you this was only a scar. And this is why the, the resectability criteria are no longer valid after neoadjuvant therapy. And the recommendation or the conclusion is that all patients without a progression, without systemic progression, that are fit for surgery should undergo a surgical exploration with uh, the aim of resection. Uh, for, this, for, for any kind of pancreatic cancer surgery, but especially for advanced tumors, we have to uh, use radical resection techniques, and I don't want to bore the, um, the, the one, um, you with, with these um, techniques, but um, what I want to say is that we have to use a, a level of dissection where go, we go directly to the arterial wall. Why is this? Because here uh, around the artery is the plexus, the nerve plexus, and pancreatic cancer has a neurotropic growth. So it grows towards the vessels. And if you don't use this layer, but, but another layer, you will, not, you will end up with a non-radical resection. After neoadjuvant therapy, frequently, as I just uh, said, uh, what used to be tumor is only scar. Here you can see a tumor after neoadjuvant therapy that still uh, completely uh, in cases the, uh, here the supramesenteric artery, and here it is taken off this artery, and you can see that this is a macroscopically complete resection. Only this, the pathologist some days after resection will tell you if this was a radical resection with R0 or if it was an R1 resection, but as I have told you, R1 resection is not a disaster, as some people think. And if you put these, uh, um, uh, um, these techniques together, we frequently end up with a, with a situs where the, super, where the veins and the arteries form a triangle, and therefore we call this in Heidelberg the triangle operation. Um, if we take these patients to the OR, um, because resectability is difficult to assess after neoadjuvant therapy, we have to be ready to do arterial resections, with this, which is in pancreatic surgery kind of the, yeah, the still, still an, a field that evolves, and uh, only a, a few centers do this. Uh, so here in this upper case, you can see this big uh, pancreatic uh, tumor in the body. Uh, after neoadjuvant therapy, I would say, uh, a, a, pronounced response, but it still would be considered unresectable. And this is after resection. So 
a venous resection uh, is always necessary in these patients. And here, the artery is completely freed. We call this a divestment. Um, so this was possible in this patient. In this patient, uh, the tumor has a little bit response, but uh, this patient dramatically responded with CA99 with a normalization. But here, this was not possible. So, so surgically, you, you go to the vessels, you control the vessels, and then you travel along the vessels in this layer where you can peel off the scar or the tumor, you don't know, uh, from, from the vessels. But in some patients, you will lose this, this layer and then it will begin to bleed and then you have to be prepared to do an arterial resection. Historically, arterial resections were associated with a very high mortality and are therefore, um, yeah, uh, even, even, even experienced surgeons fear these, um, these kind of procedures. There is different techniques for arterial reconstruction. I don't go to in, in this in detail. Uh, these were until recently the largest series of arterial resections in pancreatic cancer, uh, collected over 27 or even 36 years, uh, up to 180 arterial resections. Mortality between 0%, I think this is difficult to re reproduce, and 13%, but the median survival was poor, 15 months, and uh, five-year survival was only uh, reported in one study with 12%. Uh, but this was uh, collected over 36 years. Of course, if uh, as the systemic therapy becomes more effective, also the, uh, the role of surgery increases in these patients and the results of surgery together with, with systemic treatment will improve. This is the uh, largest study of arterial surgery for pancreatic cancer, for, local, for locally advanced pancreatic cancer from Heidelberg in more than or in almost 400 uh, patients with arterial involvement. And, um, and here in, in, a, in a half of these patients, they received pancreatectomy with arterial divestment. So this procedure where you, you uh, resect the tumor without the artery. Um, and ha in half of the patients, an arterial resection was done. Here you can see the caseload. So we see more and more of these patients. Uh, and, and in black, you can see the mortality. So a divestment a procedure without resection of the artery uh, is much safer, but also uh, with in, in the, the mortality of arterial resection is now below 7%, still much too high, but we are going into the right direction. And here you can see the median survival uh, 20 months after surgery, so probably um, uh, almost 30 months after a diagnosis of locally advanced pancreatic cancer, which is, I think, um, promising for the future. Uh, as I have said, um, if we do surgery and or any therapy, we have to weigh risk versus benefits and we have to know our outcomes. So it's important for surgeons to look at outcomes, at morbidity, mortality, and long-term outcomes. And we, we certainly did this. And uh, in this study, we, we have clearly shown that the technical complexity of a resection will be associated with uh, the morbidity. So if you do a standard resection, morbidity and, uh, is uh, still considerable with 30%, but these are also minor complications. Mortality is below 3%. Uh, if you do vascular resections or additional organ resections, the mortality increases. Um, most of the data I have shown you are from Heidelberg, which, uh, uh, and I worked in Heidelberg until 2020. Now I've been here in Vienna for 15 months and uh, after one year without mortality in my hands, um, we uh, perform now the first arterial resections. This is a young patient, 47 year old with a locally advanced pancreatic cancer with an, an infiltration or involvement of the supramesenteric artery after neoadjuvant therapy. The tumor still, there was some response, uh, but this tumor, uh, this tumor was still uh, unresectable 
and uh, in this case, you can see here in red where where we uh, the level of resection of the vein and here and the artery. And this is the situs after resection. This patient um, left the hospital after 14 days. So uh, I think we have to carefully select uh, these patients. But then, even uh, with with careful selection, even tumors that formerly are unresectable are resectable. Uh, and again, we have to look at, uh, at our results, morbidity, mortality, and long-term survival. And we will see how this patient does. He will soon begin adjuvant therapy. Um, what, so I said we need objective criteria. We also worked on this in this study uh, of almost 1,300 patients that were scheduled for a resection of a localized pancreatic cancer, pre-operative um, data. Uh, so as you know, if we take these patients to the OR, some will have metastatic disease. This is included here. So this is the pre-operative information, the pre-operative view. And uh, we, uh, looking at multiple clinical uh, parameters and uh, standard laboratory values, we identified um, uh, these factors, so the, the ASA score, which is similar to um, uh, the performance status, um, reflecting comorbidity and surgical risk, C99, CEA, of course, the known biomarkers, platelet count, and CRP and albumin. And uh, these were the independent factors associated with prognosis. And we put this together with a score based on the hazard ratios of early death. And we see that this score uh, perfectly stratifies survival in these uh, patients. And this, this is uh, uh, an objective score. ASA score is a little bit subjective, but is worldwide used and highly reproducible. Everything else is biomarker, so highly uh, objective. And uh, if we look in this entire cohort, it stratifies survival. If we look in patients that ultimately underwent resection and exploration, it stratifies survival. Uh, so this is really about prognosis independently of uh, resection. And in, in the uh, patients with resections, I, I don't show this data, uh, but this score was better than uh, the TNM-based uh, um, um, we uh, UICC uh, staging, and I think this may allow us not to do a molecularly based personalized therapy, but but a therapy have therapy decisions tailored uh, to the predicted prognosis of patients with pancreatic cancer. So, um, what's the surgeon's view, or what's my view on resectability? Resectability is about anatomical resectability, but not only. It's about tumor biology, probably reflected by this biomarker score that we will soon validate. In the future, liquid biopsies will play a bigger role, but they are not yet established in the clinic. Um, then the patient condition, performance status. And then um, it's about local criteria that have to do with your uh, center and, and uh, yourself. Um, surgical expertise, resection technique, the likelihood uh, to receive a radical resection, and also the extent of resection needed to achieve a radical resection because this is associated with the risk of morbidity and mortality. And uh, based on this, one should decide therapy sequencing. We will talk about uh, neoadjuvant strategies. Uh, and I think this is the, the hot topic in pancreatic cancer. Um, how, what else do we have to consider? I think, the, and, and this is from a work we published some years ago, the quality of care in pancreatic cancer, uh, which is structural quality, process quality, outcome quality, uh, is all about interdisciplinary teamwork and interdisciplinary treatment algorithms. And currently in clinical trials, we are looking at overall survival, but in the future, it will be much more important to look at uh, yeah, more complicated parameters. And this includes, for example, quality adjusted lifetime and also patient reported outcomes. 
And uh, with this, I would like to finish my talk, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Uh, are there any questions to Professor Stobel? Okay, start. Do you look on a routine uh, base uh, for patients uh, who undergo new adjuvant treatment on the fate of the C99 level? Is there a threshold where you say, above this level, I do not do exploration or surgery, or is this just uh, within or matter of uh, academic studies? Um, so, so clearly, CA99 levels are associated with prognosis and also with uh, the presence of systemic disease. So, so we should have a close look at it. But then there is a large part of patients uh, uh, that are C99 non-secretors or low secretors. So, so CA9, a negative CA99 or a low CA99 cannot uh, make us certain that, that the patient will perform well and there is no metastasis. And on the other hand, there, there is tumors with, with very high levels of CA99 where, where you cannot find any uh, um, distant metastasis. Uh, so I would not, um, I would certainly look at it, and, but I would not uh, decide not to operate on a patient with, uh, um, based on CA99 levels. Uh, but I think patients with high CA99 levels and probably in, in patients with a, without an enhanced bilirubin, I would say, 300 or 400 uh, in this range, I would make uh, certainly a refined um, um, assessment of, of um, uh, systemic disease before the operation with, uh, for example, with PET-CT or an MRI of the liver. And probably start with uh, uh, explorative laparoscopy. Excellent. If you have any questions, please use the microphones. For those who are online, please uh, use the chat function and you can ask the questions. So, a question. Do, do you use MRI only in the high-risk patients, in all patients before surgery, on which? Um, currently, we, we only use it uh, in high-risk patients. Uh, there is some data, uh, but not yet in, uh, in all the guidelines that uh, basically this, this should be done in all patients. Uh, liver-specific MRI. We have a question from the audience. Hi. Um, trying to get this to work. Um, lovely talk. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, do you want to comment on radiotherapy um, and how that plays into the marvelous things that you're able to do and if that enables you to do certain things more, uh, especially if you're looking at challenging resections, um, R1 situations, which you foresee happening? Uh, thank you, very, very important topic. Um, so I think um, the field is evolving in surgery, in radiotherapy, and in systemic therapy. Uh, some, some years ago, before Folfirinox came out, in Heidelberg, we heavily used uh, also chemoradiation, but mostly gemcitabine-based chemoradiation, uh, but this was kind of overtaken by Folfirinox or uh, other uh, effective systemic combination therapies. Um, but I think uh, that radiotherapy will come back. At the moment, uh, we are using uh, radiotherapy, I think, more in addition in patients where you have where, where, where you have, um, um, for example, Folfirinox, but then you still have a big tumor and still very challenging. The disease remained localized, so you have a, probably a tumor, and, and there is also molecular biology uh, about, about this, that stays local, and the risk of systemic disease is not so high, and then uh, you, can, you can invest some time in, in, in uh, radiotherapy. But I think radiotherapy will again uh, be uh, um, investigated in studies. Right now we are investigating it in Vienna in, in a study on new adjuvant therapy and, uh, and it will come back. Follow-up, great lecture. A follow-up to that question. Uh, as a surgeon, do you feel that you are being compromised uh, operating vascular and um, resections post-radiation? That is something that sometimes we hear from our surgeons 
but not all of them? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. I, um, so, so um, uh, of course, the the cases where where uh, radiotherapy was was used is probably because of the selection I just uh, spoke of are even more advanced and more difficult. But uh, the vasculature itself, uh, you know, the the material you you have to work with uh, is is good. It's the 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 vessel walls are good. Um, I, I see no problem. Okay, and I have a second question. Um, and I know it's a bit of a, a complex question. And I know the standard answer, but you have a young 55-year-old small tumor, easily resectable. And you open up and there's one single um, mental implant, tiny, two, cent two millimeters. Like, obviously, it's like our instinct, right, is just to carry on. Um, and we, but we know what the evidence-based medicine tells us to do. Where are we going, like with those patients? Yeah. So first of all, I'm happy that in in your talk uh, you showed us that all, even in systemic disease, in in exceptional responders and patients with with a special tumor biology, uh, uh, local therapy such as surgery can play a role. Uh, I think the patients have been have to be carefully selected. And uh, it's it's impossible to select a patient in this situation that you just uh, talked of. Uh, we, uh, the surgeon opens, and there is one small liver lesion. You don't know if there are a hundred more liver lesions or more deep in the liver. We don't know uh, about uh, the biology of the disease. We do not know how the disease will react to therapy. Uh, so I think close send the patient to an to an oncologist and and hopefully the patients will come back but most patients won't will not come back uh, so we have uh, a paper on more than 100 patients uh, that were exceptional responders uh, uh, um, patients with metastatic pancreatic cancer with exceptional response to palliative therapy uh, that were uh, who were uh, operated on, and um, in these patients, we have a uh, survival of, of more than 24 months, median survival, if there was a complete response of, of the metastasis. So we, for example, did uh, a, a liver segmental resection, and there was complete pathologic response at the metastatic side, not radiologic response, complete uh, um, pathologic response. But uh, if there was still active metastasis, survival was only 11 months. Uh, this paper has just been accepted in Annals of Surgery and will come out any time. Um, so this, uh, I think this is the way to go. Select patients with exceptional response. And from, from, from this paper, I would conclude it's appropriate to explore these patients. We have to go to the metastatic side first. And if, based on frozen section, the patholo pathologist says us, there is still active disease, close again. Uh, do not resect. Yeah. Important paper. Thank you so much. Uh, we go out the program. Thank you so much, Dr. Stobel. And uh, I, we will give the one, thank you very much. The one million dollar question will be given to Eric van Kutzem. What is the best new adjuvant, perioperative or adjuvant treatment approach for those patients being considered to be front up resectable? Okay, thank you very much um, for the one billion dollar question. I don't know whether it's a one billion dollar question. It's at least not an easy question. Um, and in, in this setting to answer, um, and I'll tell you the evidence or the lack of evidence and the confusion uh, sometimes because of the difficult topic um, um, in resectable pancreatic cancer. Um, 
Teresa will talk later on borderline resectable uh, pancreatic cancer. And as you've heard already, and as you know, and I will insist on that again, the, um, it's not always easy to come up um, with the clear criteria. And if you look especially in the evidence in literature, uh, there is, uh, in many of the studies, there are patients included with what they call borderline resectable, but then they still go to resection. So it's not always perfect, the literature. So therefore, um, I will, again, I will have to disappoint you that I don't have a formal answer to your $1 billion question um, today. But I will go through it. These are my disclosures. Um, and as you all know, just as an introduction, and you know all this, um, um, pancreatic cancer um, is a difficult uh, disease. Of those patients who undergo resection, and that's the topic, I talk, I, I have to tackle the topic on resectable disease, around 75 to 80% of the patients, um, despite adjuvant, or also um, we don't have so many large trials, uh, the irresectable disease, uh, despite neoadjuvant uh, treatment, will still have a relapse if you look at, um, at the data. And in total, and that's what I always tell to the patients also, 85% of patients are diagnosed with advanced, locally advanced, or metastatic disease. So only 15% are resectable, and of those who are resected, um, uh, 75 to 80% who have a relapse. And you know all these figures, and you know the difficulties. Uh, with that. The image and the discussion, and I'm not a surgeon, uh, but uh, the decision is in an MDT, an expert MDT panel, where volume, experience, and high quality imaging is important to come up with criteria on what is clearly unresectable, and sometimes it's easy. Sometimes it's easy also on the other way around. Uh, what is clearly resectable, and our surgeon was talking more about that. But then there are also patients with the, in the transition zone with borderline resectable. And that's the, the topic, uh, the difficulty, as I mentioned already, that in some of the trials there is overlap with, between resectable and borderline resectable tumors um, in this setting. Resectable is, of course, uh, com um, includes, of course, no distant metastasis, no tumor contact with the main arterial vessels, the mesent superior mesenteric artery, um, the common hepatic artery, the uh, celiac artery. No tumor contact with the superior mesenteric vein or uh, portal vein um, um, or contact uh, of less than 180 degrees. Uh, so that's clearly resectable. Unresectable is also clear. But then there is always this gray zone, and in the trials, as I mentioned already, there is not always a distinction, a clear distinction in the definition. And, and it's always, it also depends on the quality of the imaging um, in one end. Two, it depends on, on, the, on the experience of the team. Um, may also put some patients in easily resectable or borderline resectable in some situations. So what I will do is focus with all these um, disclaimers, let's say it in the beginning, focus on some of the data um, in uh, resectable disease. The initial data, and we can be fast on that in just one slide, um, uh, that summarizes the older, the initial trials. You can see some of the older trials. Uh, initially, no chemo versus um, postoperative fiber fuel. Um, then there were also some trials integrating radiotherapy. Um, the American trial, the GITSG trial, with 43 patients, but for a long time, not today anymore, but for a long time, a standard um, in the US, not in Europe, of postoperative uh, chemo radiotherapy. Um, in Europe, we had the negative ERTC trial. And then we have seen the next generation, which is the gemcitabine uh, trials, and in Asia, uh, the S1 trials, um, which set at that moment a new standard. Uh, you know, and I just want to, just to see the evolution, just to show the curves of this already older trial. This is the, an update in 2013, so almost th 13, uh, t 10 years ago, of gemcitabine versus no treatment, where um, in general, you can say that the five-year survival improves with around 10%. It still remains bad, 
still remains below 20% in this old trial. Um, but with gemcitabine, there was an improvement um, with around uh, 10%. Japan went a completely different way. And this data in Japan with S1 had been always very interesting. Um, it's never been repeated in the West. Uh, there were some attempts at a certain moment and some discussions to do an adjuvant trial with um, S1. But what our Japanese colleagues have demonstrated, at least in Japanese patients, um, S1 improved the outcome in patients compared to gemcitabine. And this became uh, the standard uh, for a long time um, in, in Japan. You've seen already the slide of the SPEC4, gemcitabine plus or minus capecitabine. Um, in the adjuvant setting. Um, some people believed in it. I would almost say were believers. The benefit was limited. There was a bit more toxicity. The trial had for sure some, like any trial, uh, some imperfect aspects. Um, we in Leuven never did, um, did this uh, gemcitabine, uh, capecitabine in the adjuvant setting. And then became um, the new standard. Um, we have to go through that um, in, uh, in view of the question um, Gerald and the scientific community asked. Uh, <coughs> and Thierry Conroy in the room. I uh, can tell you much more details than I can do. Um, he was the PI and the first author in the New England paper of the Pradesh trial of gemcitabine versus Folfirinox, which set a new standard uh, in the patients. The disease-free survival, the primary endpoint, was clearly better. You all know these data. The overall survival, um, the cancer-specific survival, uh, depend whatever endpoint you look at, uh, you see always a near a clear separation, a clear benefit in uh, in this situation. And today, uh, that's the standard in these patients who underwent a Whipple's resection or a pancreatic tail resection, wherever the tumor was localized, who recover well, who are fit, and uh, usually are below 75 fit and without too, uh, too much comorbidity um, in any stage of the disease. So regardless of the stage, uh, also including early stages, including more far advanced stages, as long as an R0 resection was done. In the same time, or a bit, uh, but reported just a little bit later, there was the APACT trial, which was formally speaking a negative trial. This was a randomized trial of gemcitabine versus gemcitabine plus napaglitaxel. Um, the primary endpoint was um, the disease-free survival by the independent uh, review committee. We looked also at uh, disease-free survival by the investigators and at overall survival as secondary endpoints. But the primary endpoint on the left was negative um, disease-free survival according to an independent panel. When we look at the DFS by the uh, investigators and at the overall survival, there was a benefit, but the benefit was modest, uh, clearly not to the amount that what we have seen um, in Folfirinox, um, um, and this was uh, never, uh, will never make it to guidelines. It's ne not approved because of the formal speaking negative uh, trial uh, in this setting. So that's what we do know in data in the adjuvant setting. And we have, of course, to start with that um, uh, to answer the question. Optimal surgery is crucial. We have heard uh, on some aspects on this. Experient teams, high volume centers, and more and more countries. Uh, if there is one cancer, some countries are like my country was until two years ago, the Wild West, where there were many, many centers. Uh, now this has been restricted, pancreatic cancer surgery to some centers, uh, higher volume centers, 20 centers still, or 22 centers for 11 million people, still too many. But that's the first step um, in this setting uh, because of the clear relationship between volume and outcome. And an adjuvant treatment uh, is there not to improve on poor quality surgery. It's there to improve on optimal surgery, of course, in this, uh, in this setting. <laughs> What's then about the question, neoadjuvant treatment in this setting? And there I have to come back to the different options. And there um, there will be, but we will have different accents. Uh, there may be some overlap also with what uh, Teresa will tell you later. She's uh, supposed to, to talk on borderline resectable. But if you look in the different trials, 
I'm not sure that the definitions in the different trials, as I mentioned, are always clean and clear, or that the interpretation and the evaluation is always clean and clear. But in general, in the neoadjuvant adjuvant setting, you may have different strategies. Um, you may start with chemoradiotherapy. You may look at combination chemotherapy regimens and then restaging and then do surgery. Or there may be, and that's then more for the initially unresectable or borderline resectable patients, uh, combination chemotherapy, restaging, and eventually at chemoradiation at that moment before uh, surgery. So in theory, you have different options that you can do. What are the data that we do have um, in this setting? Um, we have, don't have an enormous amount of data. We have some presentations at different meetings. Uh, we have the, the, one of the largest studies and full published is the Dutch Preopank study, which was a study, as you can see and as you know, um, um, a randomized study of gemcitabine, followed by gemcitabine radiotherapy, followed by gemcitabine, and then the operation and then adjuvant chemotherapy. And the other arm, the so-called control arm in orange, uh, was were patients who underwent surgery, followed by adjuvant gemcitabine. The study was done a couple of years ago before we had the data of Thierry and, uh, and, the, and the Prodige group uh, in this setting. The study is not very large. For a phase three study, it's only uh, 246 patients. Um, and they call it as borderline resectable or resectable patients. And I don't want to repeat too many times, uh, but borderline resectable, but still a randomization towards resection um, in this setting. So that, that already puts in some weaknesses in the, um, in the data. But nevertheless, the trial is relevant and can bring us forward some learnings for the future. Formally speaking, again, the trial is negative, although it's sometimes sold as a positive trial. But formally speaking, the trial is negative. The medium overall survival, there was a trend, 14.3 months uh, versus 16 months uh, in the patients with preoperative chemoradiotherapy. Uh, uh, but this was um, not just not statistically significant. Um, on the other hand, some of the other endpoints, secondary endpoints, points were clearly better, and that's not a big surprise. Our zero resection rate was higher in patients undergoing um, uh, preoperative uh, chemoradiotherapy um, um, in the trial. The median disease-free survival was also a bit better um, in these patients. And the median local regional failure, uh, disease-free uh, failure interval, was also a bit better in, uh, in this setting. Um, and here you can see the curves. Um, um, as they were published in the GCO uh, in 2020 for the different endpoints, um, left top a trend for improved survival, uh, no significant uh, difference. You can see the numbers for disease-free survival, um, local regional failure-free uh, survival, and distant metastasis-free survival. And some of the endpoints in this 246 patients, there was a benefit, a statistically significant benefit, uh, and uh, some others not. So there is clearly something in it, uh, um, but um, uh, not easy to do a correct interpretation. And I'm sure um, that there is, I will come back to that uh, much more also when she talks on, um, on uh, uh, locally advanced disease. Another trial, and to my knowledge is not yet full published, is a Japanese trial that was presented um, a couple of years ago at ASCO, and I looked it up yesterday night again to find the full publication, but couldn't find it yet. Um, it was a randomized phase two and three trial um, with neoadjuvant chemotherapy, gemcitabine plus S1. Remember, this is a Japanese trial, followed by surgery, followed by adjuvant S1. And the other patients received the so called control arm, the orange ones received the surgery, followed by um, S1 um, uh, in this setting. And as you can see, our Japanese uh, colleagues um, in their initial follow-up um, uh, reported um, in 364 patients uh, that um, patients undergoing neoadjuvant chemotherapy, they did better compared to patients um, um, with immediate surgery. Median survivals went up from 20, uh, 27 months to 37 months with a hazard ratio of 0.72. Um, in this setting. Um, 
And they report also that it's um, um, resectable, borderline resectable, but it's inherent resectable uh, uh, disease probably in this. Another trial, and I'll go through the trials uh, first um, um, and then give some considerations further on, um, is a SWOC trial. This is a trial of perioperative fulfirinox versus perioperative gemcitabin napaclitaxel. To my knowledge, not yet fully published. Looked it up yesterday night also again. Uh, and in this trial, a small trial, 100 patients in total, around 100 patients in total, patients received the three months of fulfirinox or, or three months of gemcitabin napaclitaxel before and after uh, and after the operation. Taking it down here. Sorry. If you look at the um, outcome um, in the study, the study was negative. Um, there was no difference in the two uh, group of patients and they had a preset two year survival target of 58% that they wanted to reach uh, um, in, these, uh, in these patients. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah. And then um, the final trial I think that I will present is just take you through is, um, is a trial and, and maybe um, um, we will hear more about that also. So I will be brief is the Alliance trial. It was presented last year at ASCO GI for the first time um, patients. And this was a trial of neoagent fulfirinox with or without radiotherapy. I remember the slide with the three scenarios that I presented earlier on. Uh, so patients received four cycles of fulfirinox uh, initially, um, um, and then there was a randomization, or there was a randomization, and then uh, patients continued with either a fulfirinox, either fulfirinox um, plus radiotherapy um, in this group of patients. And again, there was no uh, significant difference in this trial. And this was a trial, I guess, but it's not easy to, uh, because we don't have yet a full publication. This was a trial with a bit more advanced, but still potentially resectable or borderline resectable patients, uh, remembering and looking up at the presentation, but we don't have yet a full data sets uh, in, this, uh, in this setting. So you can see the difficulty to answer some of the question or the question of Gerard um, um, uh, in this setting. Um, some further trials, are still ongoing, um, um, and you see some examples here. I will not focus on that. Um, so we don't have a clear answer. So what do we do then uh, right now in this setting? And I think what we do in, in Leuven is we still, if it's clearly resectable in my topic, we still go for surgery first and then nitrogen fulfillinox. In the US, in many expert centers, they have changed um, uh, the way around, uh, not in all places, but in many, uh, MD Anderson, many places, uh, they, they, they start with neoadjuvant chemotherapy, also in clearly resectable patients. Obviously, in borderline resectable, there is no choice uh, often in these patients, um, uh, but in clearly resectable patients. Question is also, what do we know um, about some uh, factors that, that, let's say, prognostic factors for overall survival? these patients do bad, uh, have a high recurrence rate in general. Um, if we look, and, and there was a question on CA99, for instance, which is a clearly prognostic factor. This is a publication from a couple of days ago in JAMA Oncology um, from a Delphi panel um, of different European investigators. Uh, the initiative was taken by the Dutch, Anneke van Laarhoven and colleagues uh, in Amsterdam, looking at um, the different prognostic factors and the weight and uh, in the different trials. With all limitations in this combined analysis, combining patients from the different trials, working with Delphi panels. But at least it tells us different of the factors that we should look at or that are potential uh, prognostic factors. The end status, adjuvant treatment, um, tumor differentiation, surgical resection margins, tumor size, uh, perioperative CA99 uh, are probably the most relevant um, in this setting. So that's today, what do we do then um, in these patients? As I mentioned, um, 
Um, and as, uh, this one slide is missing, but the, the, the conclusion slide, um, as I mentioned already, um, what we do is today, and clearly we have an um, MDT, we have a strong group of surgeons um, also in our hospital, in our center, and they do around 140, 150 Whipple resections uh, with almost 90% being laparoscopic uh, resection um, in, in our center, uh, and now with the move towards robotic surgery, um, uh, starting that up, uh, uh, this program. So experience quality of care uh, is important, the quality of imaging is important, um, and with that, in a clearly resectable patient, we go still today for surgery, because we feel that we don't have enough evidence to switch yet. I think it will change in a couple of years. Um, I try to summarize some of the data that we do have, uh, Theresa will give probably other arguments with the angle of borderline resectable, with the difficulty sometimes that it's not always easy. If we have some doubt, I see also already an evolution in our team, um, my team was in my mind also, that we go re relatively, if it's an, a small tumor, then we go for surgery. But if it's a, a, there is some doubt on resectability, then uh, let's say we go faster to neoadjuvant chemo today than we did uh, three, four years ago. But the evidence is not yet there to make a statement that all patients with, um, with uh, locally resectable tumor should be treated with a preoperative uh, chemotherapy. It's not wrong to do that, um, especially if we have some of the unfavorable uh, parameters, I'm CN99 or whatever, um, uh, to mention just one of them uh, um, in this setting. Um, but so that's what we do. There's still a lot of room for improvement uh, in our knowledge, in the data for young investigators willing to be involved in some of the trials, a lot of work to do. But um, there are some milestones, and this is slightly of a similar, seen a similar variation uh, this morning by Talia, um, of some of the key milestones in pancreatic cancer, where you see some of the milestones in hydrant treatment that I had discussed. Um, um, the, I didn't put a milestone, a key milestone, of preoperative uh, treatment yet in a, in a resectable disease because that's not yet evidence-based, high-level evidence-based, uh, but we feel that the indirect uh, circumstantial evidence is going towards that direction uh, in the near future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Eric. Are there questions to Eric Stocks? We have now time, 15 minutes, for a, a panel discussion, and for that I would like to ask Dr. Strobel also to, to join us. And if you want, uh, Thierry and Halbrecht, uh, you're very welcome also to join us for the panel. It's voluntary. <laughs> Yes, so uh, thank you. So I, I have a question uh, about uh, starting with adjuvant uh, strategy. So first of all, the limit of age of Folfrinox, adjuvant Folfrinox in real 75, it's maybe for Eric and of, of course, it, but because I know that the French people are more used to to treat with Folfrinox, because for me 75, it's sometimes difficult to, to, to put this limit. And sometimes I put the limit in 70, I don't know. Yeah, I don't think we can say that hard, the age limit, eh? treated already 76, 77-year-old uh, patients, uh, and sometimes in the 71 you don't treat them. So it's not what is, is on your passport, it's how you look like, and that's an individual interpretation by the physician. And it's, of course, also the recovery um, um, of the operation. Recovery is sometimes, as, as everybody knows, not easy after Whipple's resection. 
that's in our hands at least one of the advantages also of going towards minimally invasive surgery. Uh, um, there are now data that, rec uh, that oncologically it's as good as, uh, as with um, laparotomy and the recovery is clearly faster um, in, the, uh, in the setting. So that's one of the advantages uh, so that the impact of the Whipple's resection hopefully becomes, although there are also complications, uh, becomes less, uh, less important. But uh, age is not per se, I, I made that statement. It's also, I, I believe it was in the trials an inclusion criteria, uh, but it's, it's clinical decision. I fully agree. Uh, we we, we uh, prescribe sometimes uh, uh, adjuvant for Firinox uh, until 80, but uh, this is based on performance status and uh, geriatric assessment uh, if there's a, a doubt. Uh, in the trial, there was two points which are interesting. First, and it's confirmed after six years follow-up, the dose intensity of the three main drugs has no importance. That is important, uh, it is a pronostic uh, a factor for survival, is the duration of treatment uh, the, the, uh, in the gemcitabine and in uh, the Falferinox arm uh, separately. It's very important that the same data are in SPAC-3 to, to do the six months, the 12 courses uh, uh, of Falferinox, six months of uh, gemcitabine. This is a, uh, an important pronostic factor. The other point is uh, that um, there's sometimes contraindication to uh, uh, Falferinox uh, due to cardiac uh, or neurologic uh, contraindication. We, um, uh, for contraindication due to performance status, uh, we, we can wait because uh, it's important to, to use uh, uh, nutritional care, uh, supportive care, uh, pain and diarrhea control and we can decide until the, the 12th week. Uh, there's no importance uh, on, the, uh, on the moment, on the time we begin chemotherapy. I think the prognosis and the results are, are, are not good before six weeks. And uh, it's better to postpone. And when you have a patient with uh, not full recovery, uh, at eight weeks, you can wait for one, one four weeks more, that's an important point. And uh, uh, at um, six year follow up, uh, it's clear there's uh, uh, still a, a difference of 18 months in the overall survival between the two months. So Zemzaitabin uh, alone is not sufficient, it's clear. So when there's a, a doubt uh, for cardiological reason, it could be important to, to have a complete cardiologic assessment and uh, some patients uh, have uh, stents for cardiac ischemia and uh, have a full recovery and can have uh, uh, falferinox. So it's important to, to look at what is the situation. In my opinion, it's the same patients who cannot be operated on and the same patients who cannot uh, have uh, falferinox. So uh, a, a bad performance status after uh, after surgery. This can be improved uh, by by supportive care. I, I just wanted to echo those sentiments, but I think that the SPAC three data also showed that it's better to wait. And I think there's this anxiety that you've got to start adjuvant treatment quickly, but it's not easy in these patients, and you'd rather get a good outcome with fulfurinox if you can by starting later, and the SPAC data went up to 16 weeks start, uh, and there was no impairment as long as you completed the whole, the whole course. So I think, I think getting them better is probably a good thing to do. And then I, I share your sentiments. We have a joke with the surgeons that if they can operate, and for some reason they have 84 years old as a cutoff um, in our institution, I don't know why, uh, but, but it's, it points to the fact that the, the biology of the patient is more important. Um, that if they can tolerate the surgery and they can recover from the surgery, they can probably cope with a, quite a lot of chemotherapy because of the impact of that. And also maybe the importance of this nutritional assessment, this geriatric assessment, no? in this kind of patient with 70 or more than 70, no? probably. Let me use the chance. I mean, uh, there are less data about uh, 
patient with pancreatic cancer and survivorship or follow-up program. So can you give me your recommendation? How do you follow up your patients after resection, after completion of uh, active and treatment? Yeah, th there's indeed no evidence and uh, it's a difficult topic what you should do. I think there are a couple of topics that you should do after you've stopped the adjuvant uh, treatment. Uh, so of course look at the patient, look at enzyme replacement if needed uh, with pancreatic enzymes, if they have diarrhea, steatorrhea, whatever. Uh, look at them whether they don't have diabetes, that's obviously. Um, and what we usually do uh, then for oncologic follow-up, but um, is that um, the first two years, sometimes three years, we see the patients every three to four months. Uh, we look at the tumor marker C in 99. And in our culture, um, although there is no evidence that you should do that, um, uh, we do in all these patients uh, three, four times a year a CT scan of the chest and the abdomen. Uh, you can challenge that. I see, um, I don't know whether there are Dutch colleagues here in the room, but I see a lot of Dutch patients also coming over the border. And in the Netherlands, uh, there is a philosophy uh, of not following these patients, not scanning these patients, because they say, yeah, so what if you see relapse after Fulfirinox, so what, you will not do anything for these patients. But that's not in our culture, that doesn't work. And in some patients, you can still do something, although we know the limitations in pancreatic cancer, but that's, that's what we do in our center. And again, that's more, I would call that expert opinion level. That's not evidence-based, what I'm saying. That's what I'm asking you. Yay. We have exactly the same rate of follow-up with CT scan and CRA 99 uh, in routine practice, and it was also the case uh, in PRODIGE 24. Uh, now it's considered by the National Cancer Institute in, in France that we should follow up patients, and now it's a quality control and a necessity for, for hospital to, to make the follow-up. Uh, there, were, there was until now very few data. However, uh, there's a recent publication from Netherlands which indicated uh, uh, on a very large uh, series that uh, a regular follow-up uh, leads to uh, asymptomatic uh, 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 recurrence and uh, metastatic disease and with this early treatment of uh, recurrences and metastatic disease leads to overall survival benefit. It's, it's a large series. We, we have the same impression by indirect comparison of data of PREDIS24 and the SPAC4, the follow-ups were very different, and this may explain the long survival benefit and duration of survival in the gemcitabine arm of Prodige because the follow-up was different. The time to recurrence was the same than all the, the 10 other trials, but the survival was longer, and this may be due to regular follow-up. So, I mean, the, our, our policy is, is less intense and is probably also influenced by SPAC, where they actually didn't do very many scans. It was overall survival. And, but I think there is a point to be made here that when patients relapse in the first two years, which is the commonest uh, scenario, they often relapse rapidly and symptomatically, and you could miss the opportunity to lose them. And we saw this in COVID um, to actually uh, get patients up quickly. So I think surveillance in the first two or three years can be intense, although we do it six monthly. Uh, and then beyond that, I think it's debatable whether it's a lead time, lag time bias, but I don't, I don't know. But I think the, um, the issue is about um, the, the, the salvage uh, of those patients who are gonna relapse quickly. You wanna catch those quickly. I think that's the key for me. Dr. Stubert, may I ask you, um, PET-CT scans, does PET-CT PET play a role and that you decide when to go for surgery? Do you need PET-CT at all? Or do you say only on, on individual decision? Um, in our practice, PET-CT is only used for um, selected patients, for example, with with liver lesions that uh, remain unclear with other uh, modalities of, of imaging. 
or patients with high uh, tumor markers. But from the UK, there is data basically that, that also shows that there is an economic, even economically, it's uh, of advantage to use PET CT. But I think this was, this is only from the, or not only, Sorry. but this is yeah. from, from the UK, and they're also in the guidelines, but I think nowhere else until now. I mean, it's it's sort of a similar argument to laparoscopy, isn't it? Before beforehand, is 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 you will pick up patients with nodal disease that you wouldn't normally expect, although with good cross-sectional imaging, it's probably a low percentage. But given that the surgery is so morbid, um, there may be an economic case, as you say, to to do it. So, if a patient is not fit enough for Volfirinox. Um, we have to use gemcitabine, gemcepcitabine, and if you use gemcepcitabine, it depends on the resection rate, really. So we have to give it uh, only in R0 resection rate or R1. So it's it's really different, or you use it like this, or because it's every. So my patients not all are fit enough for for filinox, no. And gem alone, it seems suboptimal, but I don't know. So I, I don't tend to use gem alone anymore. Um, but if I have a patient who's relatively frail, I might give the first cycle with gem, see how they tolerate it, and then add the cape the second cycle. But my intention is either to give volferinox or gem cape in all my patients who I think are fit uh, from, the, from our experience. When I cannot use uh, volferinox, uh, I prefer in uh, neoadjuvant, uh, locally advanced metastatic setting, use uh, a gemcitabine plus nap paclitaxel because uh, capcitabine has the same con cardiac contraindication of, of 5-FU, so there's quite no gain. Oh, in, in adjuvant, uh, uh, sometimes. It happens sometimes, but it's very rare case with a neurologic uh, contraindication mainly. As I said, if patients are not fit enough for fault filinox in the adjuvant, we go for gem alone. Um, capecitabine adds a little bit to the toxicity of uh, to uh, gemcitabine, and we are talking of patients not fit enough. And the benefit, yeah, with all the respect of the SPAC4 data, the benefit is, is extremely modest, I would say. Let me challenge you a little bit. Let's say you have a patient had resection of uh, the pancreatic cancer, received adjuvant treatment, let's say completed adjuvant treatment, but started to rise with the C99 level at the end of the Fulfirinox treatment. What do you do then? Let's, you do a CT scan, no evidence of disease, but C99 goes up and up and up. Is this sufficient for you to switch to a second line palliative treatment or do you need to see in a CT scan a relapse of the disease? Eric. Yeah, we will, after the CT, we will do an MRI uh, to have more imi a better imaging. Um, um, I don't think a PET CT contributes a lot because the challenge is usually this small, like tapioca nod nodules um, on the peritoneum and you miss them often. Um, uh, in these patients, MRI, at least uh, with diffusion, perfusion, and high Tesla machines are a bit better, um, although you miss them also sometimes. Uh, so we do an MRI, but suppose that you don't see anything, then we will let rest the patient a little bit and do a new evaluation, look at him again in three months, unless, until he gets new symptoms. In other words, we will not start on a second line treatment just based on a CA99. If the CA99 levels goes up, uh, let's say above 1,000 uh, KU per L? Yeah, we, we will not start the chemo. If, if it's at the end of Fulfirinox, that was your scenario, we will not start then with second line Gemnabaclitaxel uh, in our patients. We will wait a little bit. And you know that uh, you have to wait only a little bit. Uh, symptoms will come fast and you will see it soon afterwards. Any other opinions? I, I, would agree. I, would, I would agree with that. I mean, I've had patients who've had rises, asymptomatic rises for six to nine months, and we can't find it on imaging. So I, I don't change on markers, although sometimes if the patients get a hang of it, they get a little bit anxious about it. That's the only downside. And I think one important point is this asymptomatic, no? because it's different when a patient has some pain, no? and there's a different situation. Are there any questions from the audience? It's a unique chance. No? Yeah. 
take the chance any time. Um, if you have to choose between porphyrinox and gemcitabine, and you've got a patient that is just not quite right, would any of you consider starting porphyrinox with a lower dose or giving one drug a little bit less rather than start gemcitabine? Because once you start gemcitabine, you're committed to gemcitabine. Um, assuming you can do a lot of supportive care wonders and whatever, would any one of you consider not starting? Again, you know, you, you can wait with adjuvant therapy the, the, the 12 weeks, but assuming you feel you have to start, would any one of you consider that or would you just decide gemcitabine and then that's it? Escalating strategy? So, um, I mean, I think we're biased in the UK because we, we, um, we did focus two for the frail and elderly, where we reduced in colorectal cancer the dose and there was no impairment of outcome. And similarly with Matt C. Moore's gastric cancer study, they went down to 40% dose in the really frail patients. So I have done that. Um, and it is difficult to re-escalate the dose though once you start that. Um, but I, I don't know, I'm not doing it on any evidence base in pancreatic cancer, but I'm extrapolating it from my other experiences. I fully agree of your, of, uh, uh, with your proposal. Uh, often I reduce the first dose of irinotecan, or if I have a severe doubt, I, I begin the first course with Folfox. It happens one or twice a year, but uh, I prefer beginning with uh, a reduced dose and then escalate the, the, the dose with more security after the second course or the third course. But uh, if, if this is feasible. Does this answer your question? I think uh, we can close this session. I want to thank uh, the speakers and the discussions and uh, you for your attention and the questions. And now it's time for a coffee break. Uh, please uh, see us back here at 4.15.